I'm Monique from Guinea Piggles. Today we have a very special video about the most famous guinea pig in the world, Olga de Polga. We find out how Olga was born and how she was visually brought to life in the book. Karen Jankel, the author's daughter, reads to us from the tales of Olga de Polga. And stay tuned because near the end of the video, artist Catherine Rayner is going to give us all a lesson in how to draw a guinea pig. Olga de Polga was the invention of British children's author Michael Bond. By the time he wrote Olga, Michael was already famous for inventing the beloved Paddington Bear books, which recently became two major feature films. He also wrote the classic BBC children's TV series The Herbs, with Parsley the Lion and Dill the Dog. Let's meet his daughter Karen, who can tell us more about Olga. Well, Olga first came into my life when I was about uh, eight or nine years old. I was born in 1958, so I suppose that was about 1967. And she was my pet. Um, she was a, a family pet. But my father, uh, of course, was already a writer by then. He'd written the Paddington books, uh, the stories about the herbs. And so it was only really natural that when I acquired a guinea pig, that she would also find her way into books. So Olga was an Abyssinian, very pretty. She had uh, rosettes, three color fur, black, tan and white. Uh, very attractive. She was also quite a feisty guinea pig because Abyssinians tend to be quite feisty, so she was a real character. Well, my father was actually very fond of all animals. Uh, he has, you know, he had a tendency to put them into, into books, but in fact, my father's relationship with guinea pigs went back a long way because when he was a child, he had three guinea pigs of his own called Pip, Squeak and Wilfred. Of course, I never met them because it was long before I was born, but uh, so that, but that was when he first had guinea pigs. Well, the first Olga lived to the ripe old age of seven and a half. And then there was a bit of a gap with, with Olga's in, in our family life. But when, uh, in about the 1980s, my father had been a television cameraman with the BBC. And having written uh, several Olga books by then, he thought it'd be really rather nice if Olga uh, was, went on to television. But he thought it'd be quite fun to try and make a pilot of his own. But of course, in order to make a pilot television episode, he had to acquire a guinea pig. So he acquired Olga Mark II. And so she went to live with my father and, and stepmother and he started to, to film her. Now, after a few years, Olga Mark II sadly went the way that all guinea pigs eventually have to go. Uh, but he realised that he was quite missing a guinea pig in his life, so he then got Olga Mark III. And after a short while, uh, Olga produced rather unexpectedly Vladimir, who came into their lives. And, and after that, they, they had two guinea pigs from then on, because as we all know, guinea pigs do like to live with a companion. And there have been altogether seven uh, Olgas. So the very last Olga in my father's life before he died was Olga Mark VII. Who knows what we can expect in the future with Olga? She's she's quite a character. I think there's just a possibility that uh, I think my father thought of this idea of having her going onto television, and it's just possible that she might find her way onto television one of these days. You never know. Olga came about. Uh, it was quite funny, really. I, Oxford University Press, who published Olga de Polga telephoned me about a completely different text and I went down to Oxford to talk to them uh, and whilst I was there we realised that my timetable wouldn't allow me to work on the book that I was supposed to be seeing them for. Um, but I remember very clearly the conversation with the lovely editor at the time and she said, uh, we've got another book, um, you might not have heard of it but we'd really like you to re-illustrate it, it's been out for a while and it's called Olga de Polga. And I thought, oh my goodness, that was my favourite ever book 
when I was small. I loved that book as a child. My mum used to read it to me, and then when I was big enough, I read it to myself. Um, the, I read the whole series. I had my own guinea pigs. I've loved guinea pigs. Oh, I think I got my first guinea when I was four, and he was called Squeak, and uh, I, anything guinea pig related. So I said, yes, on the spot, I'll do it. So she said, I think the first thing that we ought to do is go and meet Michael, who is the author of this wonderful book. It was the book's 40th anniversary year coming up as well. So I had a lovely day with Michael uh, in his house, meeting his Olga de Polga, and we talked all about the characters and how I was going to illustrate his, his story. He was so gentle with the guinea pigs, it was just lovely to see him with them. I, I really like Michael. People often ask how I developed my illustration style, and a style is something that evolves quite organically, I think. Um, it's just the way that I draw. I kind of think of myself as a vessel for these characters to get onto the, um, onto the paper. Um, I also like to work in loads of different kinds of medium. I love using watercolour pencil crayons liquid acrylic inks. I love acrylic paint um, where you can, where just before it's dry, it's really lovely to scratch into um, and you can make really nice textures for fur and for example in Olga de Polga's rosettes, they, it makes them really stand out. But all my artwork exists in an original form on paper, it's not created digitally. It's, uh, it's, it's real, it's here. To develop Olga's character was quite easy in a sense because I'd met Michael's current Olga that he had so I'd got lots of photos and I knew what she needed to look like. Um, the only tricky bit I remember doing the first painting for Olga de Polga and Michael had asked if I could change her eyes. He wanted her eyes to be bigger, I'd drawn them quite small so my initial drawings they were much she had little eyes and then they ended up quite big. That was his only comment. Um, oh no, I remember struggling a bit with the texture because drawing crested guinea pigs, their fur is going in all different directions. So it's a bit of a mad ball of fluff. And um, that's when I used the technique of drawing into layered up acrylic paint for real spikiness and um, mixing that with the met metallic inks and letting it all run into all the colours run into one another and really make her feel like you could reach out onto the page and you'd feel her crested fur. She also needed to have that cheeky glint in her eye and I don't know exactly how I did that but I remember doing a lot of character drawings, probably about 50, to just get it till she just looked like her. But I remember getting her right and thinking, there is Olga de Polk. Oh, it's really difficult because she's such a character. I like her cheekiness and her stubbornness. I think she's very adventurous and she's very obstinate and quite determined. But um, you can't help but fall in love with Olga de Polga. Visually, I love her uh, punkiness, her spikiness. It's lovely to draw. And um, I think her fur illustrates her personality really rather well. It was one of my favourite projects I've ever worked on. I loved it. Um, and working with him was such a treat. Well, here I have my own copy of the Tales of Olga de Folga, which was actually signed to me by my father. And I'm going to read you chapter one of the Tales of Olga de Folga. Olga sets out. From the very beginning, there was not the slightest doubt that Olga de Polga was the sort of guinea pig who would go places. There was a kind of charm about her, something in the set of her whiskers. An extra devil may care twirled the rosettes in her brown and white fur and a gleam in her eyes which set her apart. Even her name had an air of romance. How she had come by it was something of a mystery and Olga herself told so many fanciful tales about moonlit nights, 
castles in the air and fields are washed with oats and beautiful princesses, each tale wilder than the one before, but none of the other guinea pigs in the pet shop knew what to believe. However, everyone agreed that it suited her right to the very tips of her 14 toes. And if some felt that it wouldn't come amiss if Olga was taken down a whisker or two, it was noticeable none of them tried to do it, though many of them talked of the dangers of going out into the world alone and without the protection of the humans who normally looked after them. You can't do without the sawdust people, warned one old stager known as Sale or Return, who'd lived in the shop for as long as anyone could remember and was always listened to with respect because he'd once been away for two whole days. It's a cold, hard world outside. But Olga would have none of it. You can stay here if you like, she would announce, standing here in the middle of the feeding bowl in order to address the others. But one of these days, I'm going. Whee! Just you wait. As soon as I see my chance, I shall be away. Olga was never quite sure whether she really believed her words or not, but she liked the sound of them and secretly, she also rather enjoyed the effect they had on the others. Each night before she settled down in the straw, she would look at her reflection in the water bowl, puffing out her cheeks and preening herself so that she would look at her best if any likely looking customers came along. And then it happened. Quite unexpectedly, and not at all in the way Olga had always pictured it. There were no grand farewells. There was no battle royal, no wild dash for freedom. There were no cheers whatsoever. In fact, it was all over in a flash. One morning, just as Olga was in the middle of her breakfast, a shadow fell across the cage and she looked up and saw a row of faces staring in at her. There was the sawdust person she knew as the owner of the pet shop, a man she had never seen before and a small girl. It was the girl who caught Olga's gaze as she looked up from the feeding bowl and as their eyes met, a finger came through the bars. That's the one, the girl said, the one with the cheeky look and the oats sticking to her whiskers. The door in the roof of the cage clanged open and a rough, hairy hand descended. She's yours for 22 and a half new pence, said the gruff voice of the pet shop owner, grabbing hold of Olga. Tell the truth, I shan't be sorry to see the back of her. She's been a bit of a troublemaker ever since she came in. Olga gave a squeak of outrage and alarm, and as she disappeared from view, kicking and struggling, some of the older guinea pigs nodded their heads wisely with an I told you so expression on their faces. But many of the younger ones look rather envious, for when your world is only two foot square, Almost anything else promises to be more exciting. Some of them were put off their food for the rest of the morning. But if the other inhabitants of the pet shop wondered what was going on when Olga de Polga suddenly disappeared from view, Olga herself was in a dreadful state. She didn't mind standing on an open and friendly hand once in a while, but it was quite a different matter being grabbed hold of and plonked. There was no other word for it, plonked into a cardboard box without so much as a by your leave. Straight after a large breakfast too. Her heart was beating like a tom-tom. Her dignity was shattered. Her fur ruffled beyond description. To cap it all, she felt sick. She had also made an important discovery. Going places when you know where you are going is one thing, but when you don't know, it's quite a different matter. For a moment or two, she lay where she had landed, hardly daring to breathe. But after a while, opening first one eye and then the other, she cautiously took in her new surroundings. It was dark, but there was a friendly smell of fresh sawdust and through a hole just above her head, there came a shaft of light and a cooling draft of fresh air. Olga had just begun to tell herself that perhaps things weren't so bad after all, when, without any warning whatsoever, the box rose into the air and began jiggling up and down in a most alarming manner. And as it tipped first one way and then another, 
Olga began to wish she hadn't been so boastful in the past, in case it was some kind of punishment. Old Sale Return had often gone on about the way humans behaved and how strict they could be. Olga had always thought it was sour grapes because she'd been returned by one, but now she wasn't quite so sure. There was worse to follow, for just as she was in the middle of trying to work out how many times she had actually boasted or told a story, which wasn't exactly true, the jiggling stopped. There was a roar and a strange tickling began to run through her body, starting in her toes and ending where her tail would have been had she owned one. Oh dear, oh dear, she wailed, whatever's happening now? And then in a flash, it came to her. The noise, the tickling, the feeling that she was going somewhere even though she herself wasn't moving, it could only mean one thing. A motor car! she exclaimed, jumping up and down with excitement. I'm in a motor car! Olga knew all about motor cars because she'd seen them through the pet shop window, but never in her wildest dreams had she ever pictured herself riding in one. Gathering her courage in both paws, she clambered up the side of the box and by standing on tiptoe, managed to peer through the hole above her head. Of the houses and shops she'd grown up with, there was no sign. Instead, all she could see was green countryside, miles and miles of it. Fields, hedges, trees, banks covered with luscious looking dandelions and thick, mouth-watering grass all flash past with the speed of the wind. If this is the outside world I've heard so much about, decided Olga, I think I shall like it. It's much, much better than a stuffy, crowded old pet shop. Then she pricked up her ears, for above the noise of the engine she caught the sound of voices. First a deep one, and then, then another much younger, which she recognised as belonging to the little girl who picked her out from among all the others. You'll have to look after her, Karen, said the deep voice. Come rain or shine, no excuses. I promise, the second voice paused for a moment and then went on. I do hope she likes her new home. She'd better, came the reply. It cost me enough to build. What with the wood and the roofing felt, glass for the bedroom window, wire netting for the doors and legs to keep her away from Noel. As the man's voice droned on, Olga sank back onto the floor, hardly daring to believe her ears. I'm going to stay with some sawdust people, she breathed, all by myself. And in a waterproof house with a bedroom, she added dreamily, on legs. Why, I must be going to live in a palace. I really must. How to Draw a Guinea Pig by Catherine Rayner. You will need a sharp pencil, a nice sheet of paper, an eraser, a pencil sharpener and some colouring things. Step one. First, draw two wobbly potato shapes on a nice piece of paper, like this. There's a picture of a potato underneath, just in case you've forgotten what one looks like. Step two. Then add one more potato shape in the middle. Guinea pigs are longer than you think. Step three. Next, you need to add two little Wellington boot shapes like I have here, and then draw a shape that looks a bit like a guinea pig poo. Step four. Now add a wiggly W shape in the middle potato shape. This will be your guinea pig's ear. Step five. Now draw a simple dot right in the centre of the left potato shape for the eye. Step six, the nose is just a lovely, slightly curved line. Step seven, and the mouth is a simple curve underneath. Copy the half moon shape I have made. Step eight, now to draw around the edge of the potato shapes to make a nice smooth guinea pig shape. Step nine, it's time to add details to your guinea pig's front and back toes. Copy the way I have done it here. They look a bit like tiny little sausages. Step 10. This is my favourite part. It's time to add whiskers. 
Make them big and wild or short and neat as you like. Now you can rub out your guidelines, the potato shapes we drew first. Your guinea pig drawing is nearly complete. You just need to add fur. One of the wonderful things about guinea pigs is how different they all are. You can personalise your guinea pig to make him or her look like your very own pet, or perhaps the guinea pig you daydream about owning one day. If you like, you can also add a little friend for your guinea pig to be talking to. I chose a butterfly here, but you can add a bee or a nice flower or even draw another guinea pig. The main thing is to have fun.